like Amos. Mama, is dinner Amos ready? I'm hungry. It's Amos done. Give it five more minutes, okay? Look at how it's Amos Christmas. Look at all these people. Why am Amos at the front of the line? What do you not want? Let me hurry up, my team. And this is Amos off. Excuse me, do you guys have any Christmas trees left? I've looked everywhere. No two Bermudians sound alike. Unless they're lapsing into the vernacular. And then you get a similarity. You know, Bermudians really are bilingual. We speak English and we speak Bermudianese. Bermudians be like, Don. But what were you children down there doing? What, Mama? We know it's just downstairs playing. Who do you think you're talking to, little girl? You need to turn it down, okay? We're very dramatic and we tend to mimic people from other cultures. But we should know our own. I don't even believe it, man. I just went down. Bikes all scratched up, man. I love being away and picking out a Bermudian just by hearing them. Za, go lay down, please. Hi, I'm just turned into Retina Road, where I'm going, because you know, I need to know where I am. I'm from up the country, I know where I am. And it's like, oh yeah, there's a Bermudian over there. And it's like, oh, hi, nice to meet you, I'm from Bermuda too. How much gas you get, sweetie? You might as well just fill it up. Bermudians, by nature, are sponges for culture. I need to know, you think it's going to be ever way? Bermudian culture borrows from English, from West Indian, from Portuguese, whatever works. We like it, hey, it's ours now. And we make it and, and meld it. Ooh, what's that? Can I have some? You need to know what it is. What, what is it? You guys doing a keys plan today? We got miles well go. Come on. Beans, you came all the way out there. I might as well take a picture. It's miles <laughs> 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 I left the island at 13 to go away to high school and I thought that I sounded American or Canadian, you know, I didn't sound Bermudian. And I'm thinking, okay, I'll fit right in, they won't be able to tell. And they're turning heads like, what did you say? I'm like, uh, I don't know, I said exactly what you just said. How does it sound? And they're like, yeah, you say, oh, and um, scoot, like, the typical parts of our dialect that distinguish us from anybody else, you know, him and school, but I don't think I sound like that. And it was really interesting to just get all of those comments and when you think that you don't sound any different from them. My name is Brittany Bubbler and I completed my bachelor degree of arts in linguistics and I've done some work on the Bermudian dialect. I've written two papers, one on the sound system, so the way that we pronounce our words, and then the other one on the words that we actually use, so more of our vocabulary. So I really focused on what words of our dialect are still in use and what words have either disappeared or have changed and compare it to different dialects of English. I think linguistics drew me because it encompasses so much. Like you have to be aware of political structures. You have to be aware of the changes in the workplace, gender issues, gender differences. You have to be aware of geographical changes because they all relate to the way that we speak, the way that we communicate. And I chose that because I see the value of communication.
1984, it was a big anniversary year for the discovery of Bermuda. So we thought we'd do a contribution to the heritage by writing a dictionary of the Bermudian language. I'm Fred Barrett, part of Not the Elmond Players for many years, also wrote Bermudian Verds with Peter Smith. So Peter Smith and I got together and just started compiling words as we recalled them, as we used them, and carried around a notepad. And as you go through conversation, you recognize words and phrases that were in everyday use, but you couldn't think of initially. So over several months, we compiled the list of words and made up our own definitions of them. The initial printing was 2,500. First edition was red. They sold out in a couple of weeks. So we had to do a second reprint of 2,500 almost immediately. And then the next edition was in 1985, the green edition and the blue. The pink edition now is the current one. I always enjoy telling people that they're all the color of milk cartons every year. The filled milk, fresh milk, the skim milk, and the 2% fresh, I think that's what it is now. So. There have been changes, a few deletions, but not many. Some corrections, not many. If you speak any language, the idiom changes. There are new catchphrases every year, so we tried to add new ones as we heard of them. It just seemed to catch a chord as the Bermudians love things about Bermuda. And it's become a, a, almost a customary gift to Bermudian students going away to college. They take this, off, take this away with them to help educate their, their classmates about Bermuda. The response was overwhelming. I started out as a teacher and I went over to community services in 1984 and I never went back. My name is Ruth Thomas and I'm retired but a lot of the things that I'm doing now are connected still with culture. At that time, now I'm going back remember to the 80s, 1980s, Bermudians were still saying we do not have a culture. Boy, and that used to annoy me. And I would simply say, well, look at our architectures. Look at the foods we eat. Look at all these churches around here. Look at our vernacular, any country's vernacular. It's right there in front of you. How can you say we don't have a culture? There's so much just hitting you in the face that's our culture. I think our vernacular, any community's vernacular, is important. The vernacular tells you who you are. It's our identity. It's a part of us. If you go to Timbuktu and you're in a room, a huge room, crowded with people, all using their own language. If there's one Bermudian in there, no matter how posh that Bermudian speech is, there's gonna be something that's related to the vernacular that that person will say that you will say, ah, oh, that's a Bermudian over there. You may not know the person, but you know by something they've said in their speech that it relates to the Bermudian vernacular. And it's important because immediately you're making a connection. Immediately, you're able to identify somebody who has something in common with you. I love our vernacular. Right now, I have worked on uh, the social part of the dialect as well as the sociolinguistic part. So how does our dialect relate to our sociology, to the place that you live, how much money you make, what ethnicity you are, where your parents grew up? all sorts of things that you can tell from speech that I think are important to the history of Bermuda and the history of our dialect. And just in my observations, our grandparents use a more British twang to their dialect and the young people today use a more American sounding dialect. So my grandparents, even my mom and dad will say can't, but my peers or those younger than me will say can't and not can't. And that's just because of the change in relationship that we've had with Britain and the United States. But our dialect has kept a lot of the British features. So we say, um, go, I'm, I don't speak the dialect very well, <laughs> but I'll try. And 
goat, like saying goat sounds more British than it does American. Um, and then outside of that, the features that are unique to Bermuda, Bermuda um, are things like home and school. Um, those things aren't really seen anywhere else in the world that I've discovered so far. And so those are things that have lasted um, hundreds of years in our dialect. And that's something that's good to see because it means that we are preserving part of our culture. And even though our standard form, so what we identify with when we're speaking to different groups of people has changed our dialect, what, what we speak at home has it. At home has it. <laughs> When I went to England, I used to talk about it's getting darksome and it's lightsome. And I had an English friend who said, there's no such word. I said, yes, there is. What's wrong with you? Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> said, look, I'll look it up in the dictionary. It's not here. But it's a part of our vernacular. And we know exactly what it means when we talk about it's getting darksome. It's light. And you know, we've got some of those archaic words, some of those old English words still. Um, in, in our vernacular, and I hope we hold on to them. I think it's important to have the vernacular in a written form, because that's one way of preserving it. But it's hard to do. It's very difficult to write. We made up the spellings in our book, trying to spell them phonetically, so that you could look at the printed word and say it aloud and have it sound correctly but that's impossible to do in, in some cases. How do you spell on? You know, it means yes, I'm agreeing to, but on, how many A's are at the beginning of on? How do you spell it for a dictionary? And is there a G and an H or just a G? I mean, these are the things we, we wrestled with <laughs> as we tried to write it. And some of the definitions we, we really had to make up. It's something that everybody knows what it means, but how do you describe it to somebody who doesn't? We had a lot of people contact us after the first book came out with their own suggestions for things that we missed out. So we, the, the second edition, we had a lot of input from, from uh, the public. Not all Bermudians use all those words, but all Bermudians use some of them. I think the words were developed locally, and they start off just a bunch of people, this is what we're going to call this, and it spreads from there. It was a lot of fun to do, I must say. And we tried to exclude all the West Indian slang, the English slang, and the American slang that we could. We took out things that we thought were obviously not Bermudian. Our language was obviously influenced by overseas, but which came first? Did we say it first or did they say it first? So now with satellite TV and the internet, everything's commingling a lot quicker and people are becoming more homogenous rather than their own little corner of the world dialects. So we're probably going to not have our own words so much anymore, unfortunately. This next piece was written specifically for the Folklife Festival in Washington. We wrote a bunch of things specifically for that show to help educate Americans who have no idea what a review was about, oh. about the other. So, <laughs> anyhow, um, this is the Bermuda word chant. It uses the Bermuda vernacular. Chris is our orchestra leader. He will count the city. We speak English in Bermuda with a special inflection. We also have some very special expressions. It's not a hard word. I'm Bruce Barrett. I'm one of the original founding members, writers, producers, actors of Not the Um Um Show. Not the Um Um was local satirical comedy. Well, here's to us. Yeah, yeah. You all made it through. I've got to tell you, though, there was a time there when I was real worried. Like when the storm hit, right? Yeah. I was going to work. Driving along on my bike and a great big cedar tree fell right across the road in front of me, right? 
When I tried to back up, a Belko light pearl fell right down behind me, missed me by that much. Man, plenty of room. You see this? Twelve foot satellite like this. Whoa! I'm very conscious of my speech patterns and intonations when I'm talking, you know, who I'm talking to. A Bermudian accent is different, and, and because we're a Bermudian show, that's why we did it in the Bermudian vernacular. Be thankful you're still good, Lord. I'm running glass bottom boat tours to my patio. <laughs> well, glad they finally got the power back on. Yeah, right about that. Uh, and I was tired of dipping with that bucket. <laughs> At least you had a bucket. <laughs> Welcome to the stage. Welcome, Stefan, everybody. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my name is Stefan Johnston. I'm a Bermudian poet. Um, my superpower is being able to use the Bermudian dialect in poetry. As you sit back and relax, as these verbs ricochet off this track, it's hard to forget how potent this media be. But I see too many white people falling victim to characters on TV they strive so hard to be. But solo is the realest and the poets of SJDRaw.com are the illest, so fill us with more emotions than heartbroken drug dealers. Cause if real recognize real, then ideal on a level that's ideal for philosophical prophecies that reside between the lines. And these metaphorical rhymes laced with dimes and crystals to keep you high. So fly with me, cause from the womb to birth, Solo has been destined to shape earth with a pen and a pad, touching the ears of the youth like pillowcases may have, catching them tears, keeping your head right as daytime nears, and it's made so clear that when I hear just to breathe there, cause our purpose is divine, and only in time will you two realize what you're here for, so don't give up and never stop until my young black brothers stand up mm -hmm. and show them what's strong and use the weapon of mind and the lessons of time to counteract the way we are personified in today's world as lacking honor and drive. Because we all have the power to be African kings, controlling the masses and conquering scenes, creating magnificent dreams that paint immaculate portraits of beautiful queens that stand by our side and mother our seeds. So brothers, please, please, yes. don't waste your life. We're all linked in the same chain, so let's rise up together tonight, and let's make it right, and be Bermudians in flight. Fire. That's just how I write and how I put things together. Um, I love the Bermudian language and I love to perform with it and write with it, and use it and push it out to the world. Alright, I feel like telling you about the story tonight, but I'm going to need your help, alright? So when I put my hand in the air like this, I want you guys to say, take it back. Can you guys do that? Take it back. Alright, let's practice. Take it back. <laughs> I'm a big hip-hop head, but I like the intellectual hip-hop that really makes you think and, and, and listen to the lyrics. And, and a lot of what, what they're saying is, is, is relevant to the time and to the people. And I've always wanted to do that for Bermuda. Speaking how I speak, how my people speak. Well, it feels like this. My boy comes down and he's like, Stephanie, you write poetry? Why are you soft? Take it back. It just feels more real to me. You know, there's a lot of Bermudian rappers and reggae artists, and they sound American or they sound Jamaican. And me personally, I mean, if you do it, that's great. And if you do it well, that's amazing. But me personally, I couldn't do it. I've tried it, it just doesn't feel comfortable. You know, it just doesn't feel right. But when I speak how I speak and I make it work, it feels, feels great. He was only 23, and his mind was in need of something real. Too much thug appeal for blinky claim to kill when he adversary. Commentary of his ways crossing the island like waves. Unknown how he caught up until his actions paved the road he never expected. His best friend shot with an automatic weapon. Now he's trying to plug up his leaky brethren. Too much blood, God's help is asking for the first time. Find his eyes open wide. Consciousness awakening. Life is too precious to be faking it. This a major detour, we can't keep taking it. Let me pull over the exit I'm taking, man. See, at times it seems like life roads just need bigger signs for the exits. Because some of our roads are so hectic, we never even check if our actions are progressing. But that begs the question, how do you define progression? But and that's not mine, but yours to question. See by the clock on the wall and you watch on my wrist that it's 7 o'clock. 
Times with your latest news here on Radio Mohawk. I make no apologies ever for having used Bermudianisms and Bermudian accents in there. I mean, Radio Mohawk's whole raison d'etre to get real fancy and dicty is the fact that here's, here's somebody who doesn't talk like they're educated, but the content of the stories are very pointed and poignant and don't ever judge this book by its cover because yeah i may sound like i don't know what i'm talking about but trust me i know how many blue beans make five <laughs> We have the latest news from the Mohawk newsroom. Her, I am. And it was always with affection, because I'm a Bermudian, and, and I by no means you know, think that I'm ignorant um, in any sense of that word, which in Bermuda has many meanings. There is a joy and a comfort and a familiarity with talking to fellow Bermudians. There is a homespun wisdom and you know that kind of folksy way when you speak to fishermen or to farmers or to construction workers or you know, guys who they know what they're doing, they're good at what they do. And there's a, an easygoing way and we are an easygoing people by and large. You know, I honestly don't even know if a Bermudian accent, as broad as it used to be, will, will even be around in the future. Um, you know, because that, that, those intonations, those words, they disappear if they're not used. You know, and words that were in Bermudian words as being the hip slang words of the time. You look at them now going, no one says that anymore. You know, it, it is, that, but that's part of the dynamics of culture. It's changing. Well, this isn't Bermuda culture here today, and this is how it will always be. There are tradition bearers who stick with certain things. You know, there's a right way to make a kite, and there's a right way to make a cassava pie, and there's a right way to sail a Bermuda dinghy. So there are certain things that remain constant, and then all around it is swirling change. There was points where I was performing seven times a month at different venues, like open mics. And I was living in Toronto at the time. And a lot of stuff I was saying was so Bermudian that no one in the crowd would understand me at all. And I started to realize that there was this Bermudian dialect that I had that I didn't realize I had it and no one understood it. So I started to write stuff that would appeal to an audience outside of Bermuda, but Bermudians would also take something different from it. And then stuff that was just uniquely Bermudian that no one outside of Bermuda would understand. And then the whole aspect of my style was born from that, just floating between Canada and Bermuda. And, you know, when you're put in a situation that's outside of your, your, your normal environment, you really get a feel for who you are and what you bring to the table. And that's how it all started for me. I took her to the moon so she could watch the earth set. We took our time, so I spoke in cursive. More words, stuff. She whispered to me, so I sped it up to calligraphy. Fancy strokes, yes, indeed. Her eardrum was beating me. Now I'm conscious of what I'm doing, I'm conscious of the dialect, I'm conscious of what works in different audiences, of what a Bermudian will understand and what someone, a non-Bermudian, wouldn't understand. And as I started to perform more and record more, I wanted something on there that was strictly Bermudian. So I have tracks on it that's Bermudian. Like, if you're not Bermudian, you're probably not going to understand it. I even say that on there. <laughs> um, but I want to keep that, keep that going because I, it's fun. It's fun, especially something that's uniquely Bermudian and no one else can understand it. What I write is what I learn and see, which gets filtered through me. So what you hear is who I be, because I cannot write what I cannot see or feel. And I never had a choice. There was no red or blue pill. It was just write what you feel and design what you will, and your future will fall into place. And I know these words seem hard to be true, like a straight here. I think here. Bermudian poetry can bring Bermudians together and make them feel like they belong. Now that three albums out, and it's like, I don't know, it's weird. I've become... Uh, advocate for Bermudian dialect, which is never my intention, but I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be that person. I think I can do it. <laughs>
My personal belief is that the dialect is something that's positive about our culture. Our dialect can tell the world about you as an individual, and it can demonstrate to the world that you are Bermudian. But right now it's seen in sort of a negative. Labov did a study, it's a linguist named Labov, did a study related to preserving dialects and attitudes towards dialects in Martha's Vineyard. And he found that the people in Martha's Vineyard who wanted to leave viewed the Martha's Vineyard dialect as completely negative. They didn't speak it, they didn't think it was a good thing, and they wanted to speak more like the Bostonians because Martha's Vineyard is close to Boston. But the people who enjoyed being in Martha's Vineyard viewed the dialect positively. They wanted to keep it, they thought it was great. So preserving our dialect greatly relates to how we feel about it. So there's something called the bi-dialectal approach, and I think that's something that Bermuda could use. And basically you're teaching appropriateness, so when is it appropriate to use your dialect, when is it not appropriate to use your dialect, saying that it's okay to switch between the standard form and your dialectal form. It's not correct to say that you're speaking properly, it's correct to say that you're speaking more standard. And I think that teachers can help this by just showing the children that, okay, I'm teaching you now, I'm going to speak a little bit differently than I would if it's after school. And that just emphasizes the fact that it's okay to switch. You're not being a fake person, you're not losing your identity, you're still Bermudian, you're still who you are, I'm still Brittany, whether or not I'm speaking in a more standard form versus speaking in a more relaxed form. You're just allowing yourself to be heard by more people and communicate more efficiently. It's no use going up there and saying, y'all I'm going down the road to an American, and then you have to repeat yourself. Why not just say, I'm going down the road, right? So the bi-dialectal approach, it's just a means of communicating with a larger amount of people more efficiently. And I think that teaching those two things, exposure and appropriateness in our school system can definitely help, see, help us see the dialect differently. Most Bermudians, in my experience, have two ways of talking. They, they talk proper in, in business to, um, to people overseas at the office, you have a different way of talking. If you're around your mates on a weekend, you talk differently. Hey, Jim! Hey, what are you doing here? I didn't see you when I came in just now. Are you a vice? You know what? Oh, yeah, I said good morning and everything. <laughs> you put in different accents, you throw in different words. Um, you know, and you can, you can tell some people talk real dicty when they're, when they're at work. But when you get them on the weekend, they're not at all. Uh, anyway, how are you doing, Matt? Man, I am taking a lick. Stop getting noisy, right? <laughs> if I had half your money, I'd burn it all of mine, I'd say that. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, look at you, all pressed out, looking dicty there. How would I describe dicty? Well, let me look in the book. May I? Let me look in the book, see what it says. Dicty. Fancy. Scholars talk real dicty. Or good, well done. Something could be dicty. Certainly, you have to have a dicty voice or dicty way of talking if you're going to succeed in business, certainly internationally. You can't go into big reinsurance companies and, and talk about your ace boys and things to your clients. Is that where you're working now? Uh, these days I'm vice president of our incarnation re. <laughs> some people who are Portuguese and they have a conversation where changing back and forth between Portuguese and English 
in mid-sentence. So the conversation is being carried on in two languages at the same time. So if they can do that, that's the reason why we can't change my accent back and forth. It's just a, a situational thing. If you're at work, you're, you should be more, more formal. You have a, a business approach, you dress differently, you talk differently. When you're relaxed, you, know, you, you don't put socks on, you wear your dark sweaters without your socks, and you talk differently. When I went to the Ministry of Community Services and Culture, people didn't understand or hadn't taken time out to understand the meaning of the word culture. In fact, people were afraid of it because um, they felt it, it was highbrow. The minute you said the word culture, they thought you meant, oh, opera, oh, you mean ballet, you mean all of that stuff. And some people would even say, oh, you mean that white stuff or that European stuff, you know. Um, so I knew that something had to be done about that, but what? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We're very happy to have you here today. Uh, St. Paul's is particularly pleased to welcome all of you here, and most particularly, Ruth Thomas and company. So then I thought of the stage. I thought, well, why not just write conversations? And I didn't know what to call the stuff, so I call each one mosaic. And each mosaic is different. Our musical heritage is steeped in religious music. All of those old hymns from the Church of England hymnal gave Bermuda its start in music when the English militia came. They added another musical segment. Maybe that's why Bermudians on the whole like marching music. Mm -hmm. We'll follow a band anytime, anywhere. <laughs> and each mosaic deals with a particular event or an individual or the particular place. And now here we stand or sit in this St. Paul, an African Methodist Episcopal Church, a church that has served the local community well. It has given so many people not only spiritual nurturance and cultural awareness, but a sense of identity. We applaud St. Paul AME Church. Yeah. With the history, the stories, the gossip, everything connected with that subject. By the way, everybody had a special seat in St. Paul, and if anybody sat in somebody else's seat, I, it doesn't happen now, I know, Reverend, it doesn't happen now. <laughs> but if anybody sat in somebody else's seat in those days, they would give you such a hard look. The, 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 there was a, a Mrs. Innes who had her special seat, and if she found anybody sitting in her seat, she would just walk into the chair and she'll sit right down on them. <laughs> I do a lot of researching, write the scripts myself, and when I'm writing a mosaic, I put down what I remember or what I've found through research or what people have told me. But when we are performing them, somebody in the audience will say something to us that gives us more information or triggers something in our memory. Grace, mm -hmm. I can't remember Grace's last name. Grace had a strong elder voice. Wasn't me, you sure? What's Wasn't me? Grace is. Grace. 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 Richards. Richards? Richards. Richards. You remember her? Grace Richards. Uh, All history is so important. They could do. They called you can. Hey, yes, boy, of course. And, Don't know what uh, that means, but. That's what they call <laughs> But she was an excellent teacher. And we don't hear much about her. You know, you hear Edith Crawford, mm -hmm. Mr. Scott, um, Mrs. Scott, but you very seldom hear about Mary Louise Williams. But she did a lot for young children in her schools. And let me tell you, if you could teach under Mary Louise Williams, then you knew you were a good teacher and you could teach everywhere. So being able to, to put some of that oral history with the gossip, some of the people in our audiences would say, oh, that's what that was about. My grandma used to say that. They would be able to make a connection, you know. The two things, the oral history and the gossip, tell us a lot about ourselves, a lot that you won't find in the written history, you know, and they're both important, just as important as the written history, I think. Thank you very much for having us here today. 
May God bless you and this church as you continue to follow the order to feed my sheep. This is indeed the Black Cathedral of Bermuda. Thank you. So people have been grateful for him. And I think it's simply because the timing was right. People were hungry to hear by themselves. What an awesome treat we had, amen. I'm excited because uh, my name was in it, amen. <laughs> and obviously they could identify with the material. And as I said, there are well over about 75 now have been done, and each one is different. At one time, folk tales were strictly all. So you could move from country to country and improvise, adapt, whatever. The Caribbean, Africa, they can tell you stories from way, way back and bring them right up to the present. Sad difference is that we did not do it as a community not to the extent that other countries did it. And we have waited so long that we've lost many of the stories. I am Florence Webb Maxwell, and I'm a folklorist. I was doing my degree in library service at Atlanta University, and the professor said, I would like to hear the folk tales from various countries. Realize I knew all about the British folk tales, I knew all of them. I couldn't think of one Bermuda folk tale. So I came back home and lined up people, and I noticed, sure enough, no complete story. But I found motifs that I could relate to other folk tales. And that was the beginning of my research. I discovered when I went to Dr. Long that while I didn't have a once upon a time, as I put it, I had folk medicine, I had superstitions, which you do not call superstitions, you call beliefs. I don't know if you're familiar with Martha's Curse, for instance. Martha was an excellent candy maker, particularly for coconut cakes. And she did so well that she decided to enter the agricultural exhibition. Bermuda at the time was segregated, and she hesitated, but finally felt, well, since the merchants on Front Street all bought her coconut cakes, no reason why she couldn't enter and get their support. But when she got to the gate, she was stopped and told, no way, you can't because you're colored. And she told them, that's okay. I will curse the exhibition. It will rain, rain, rain. And of course, the Royal Gazette has documented that the agricultural exhibition has been rained out many, many times. And any time people see that rain coming, it's Martha's curse. <laughs> and that's, that's the story of Martha's curse. I remember hearing a Bermudian rapper once use a Bermudian accent. And I was like, whoa, I felt so proud. Like everything he was saying made so much sense to me. And the way the words he was using and the cadence he was using, I felt like I could relate to it more. Like, I was giggling, I was laughing. You know, it was amazing. It was amazing. Like, it was great. I mean, even when I perform my Bermudian pieces, I knew this that Those are the pieces that Bermudians like the most. The ones that it's truly Bermudian, really, really Bermudian. And I don't even think a lot of times they're not even completely listening to what I'm saying but they hear the references, and they're like, wow, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what that's like. So I see it definitely going in that direction for that day when there's like a lot of Bermudian poets that are putting out work, putting out books, putting out albums, stuff that's uniquely Bermudian, and I'm excited for that day because it definitely brings people together. Definitely, definitely. Folk tales and folklore should be handed down. My favorite, of course, is the one in the graveyard. One day, two fishermen had caught what they called a voyage of fish, and they were on their way home with their spoils. 
The rain came suddenly. It poured one of the torrential rains. And they were near the Pembroke Church. So they decided to shelter on the porch. And while they were there, a young man walked past and he heard, one for you, one for me, one for you, one for me. He was so scared he ran home and he told his family, God and the devil are in the graveyard dividing up souls. His family said, a lot of nonsense. That's a lot of nonsense. He said, come back with me. And the brother, he said, okay, I'll go back and I know this is not a fact. So when he got there and stood behind the gate and listened, sure enough, one for you, one for me. One for you, one for me. And just as they were about to move off, one said, oh, don't forget the two we left at the gate. And they took off to use the Bermuda vernacular. They were gone in a hurry because they were so sure that the two left at the gate were two souls to be divided with the spoils. So they had no idea they were fishermen. And that's my favorite story because of its background, its origin, more so than, it, than its content because it sounds like a joke, but it's a folk tale. I have a series that I'm writing called The Quest. I always love mythology, Greek mythology and stuff. And I said, I'm going to write my own and make it Bermudian. Why not? And I eventually want to turn it into a children's book. I've um, been working on a children's book with April Branco to turn the whole series into a, a children's book. So that's another project that I'm trying to get out sometime in the future and just kind of build on it over time, incorporating Bermudian elements and real history and you know, take poetic license for different things and just have fun with it. Me personally, I always liked performing Radio Mohawk. In science news, a group of dedicated East End aeronautic engineers have formed an organization with the sole objective of putting a Bermudian on the moon. <laughs> Calling themselves the Bermuda Aviation Discovery and Blast Off Organizing Movement, the members of Bella Boom say they are close to finishing their lunar module and they invite locals to call them with suggestions of who should be the first loony that they send to the moon. I took great joy in writing the stories and, and the challenge of trying to take the day's headlines and create a story to slip into the newscast from the headlines or what was going on that day. Um, when Egg Smith escaped from casemates, I did a series of awful egg-related puns. He scrambled to freedom and a hard-boiled criminal and da da da. And people were, were killing themselves laughing and what was because it had happened that day. It wasn't a prepared piece. In police news, detectives are investigating the theft of a variety of foodstuffs from a Texas road home. Police say thieves broke in and stole a gallon of full-fat double mocha fudge chunk ice cream two dozen jelly donuts, and a quart of eggnog. Officers are pursuing leads at the King Edward Memorial Hospital and expect to make a cardiac arrest. The fact that we're doing it live, we actually really did go all out. There's no arguments about that. And I think people appreciated the energy and the effort. A well-written, witty piece that makes you laugh out loud, is, 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 that's an astonishing talent to be able, with a, on a flat page with written words, make people laugh. But there's all kinds of, of great writers that do that. They conjure up images with words and makes your mind and you immediately connect. Bermuda has been one of the world's most isolated islands, and it has not always been easy to make a living here. Bermudians learned early on to be resourceful. In fact, up to the mid-1700s, Bermuda's biggest source of foreign exchange was shipwrecks. 
The practice of using false beacons to lure unsuspecting ships onto the rocks and then relieving them of their valuables was the start of our tourism industry. <laughs> Unfortunately, this kind of tourism did not attract repeat visitors. We save our cinema society. We want to do a comedy show review to, to raise money. So we got together and did the first year of, of Not the Yum, I'm sure. Are you trying to tell me there was absolutely nothing you could do without this guy, Tommy? Now, you said you wanted a real Bermuda Shutters, right? Yes, 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 yes. yes. Tommy is the last real shutter man in Bermuda. Yeah. Right? He was going to hook you up with those nice ones that fasten on the wall, right? They fasten on the wall? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're right in there, real good. So how do they close, then? Oh, they don't close. No, 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 no. no. They're screwed. Screwed right into the wall. Yeah, but what happens if we have another Fabian? No problem, no problem at all. They're screwed on real tight. <laughs> Bermuda has always been right for satire. What about the windows? Windows? Well, then you just nail up plywood like everybody else does. What, you mean like what I've got right now everywhere? Yeah, yeah, exactly like what you, you do. You do things now. as Bermudians normally do them, and it's usually funny. <laughs> That's just the way we are. <laughs> Not the Unknown Players was a lot of fun to do. Nice to be nice, you did. Yeah. No, no, what can I do for you? A lot of work, but a lot of fun. Is this where I check in? Uh oh. <laughs> is, that, is that a yes? Uh oh. Well, I want to go to New York. Don't we all? Political satire in most countries is revered. Bermuda it is a great place for satire as long as the audience is ready for it. You know, and satire is comedy that makes you go, ah ha ha, ooh. Uh, why do you want to be done? Oh, well, I need a second door. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Mr. Bernie. 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 Hello, Mr. Bern
I think that the Bermuda Inverts book is a key part to preserving our dialect. I think it's great to have something in print that demonstrates the words that we've used in our dialect, whether or not we still use them or not. So I use the Bermuda Inverts book heavily to do my research. There's thousands of words in there. And many of the words are words that we still do use, but there are some that we don't use and there are some that are being replaced and are changing their definition, um, such as ace boy. In the Bermuda Roots book, it was a friend of yours, someone who you have a close relationship with. But in the survey that I did, many of the younger people, so 20 and below, defined it as a stranger, like if you're trying to get someone's attention, ace boy, come over here. And I thought that was interesting because I still use it as a term of endearment, you know, that's my ace boy. In the Bermuda and Verdes book, we also have hot for being drunk. <laughs> and that was prevalent in the mid age group, so 30s to 50s. Um, Drunk was used in the 50 plus, and tapped was something that the 30s and unders used more, and that wasn't in the book. And that's called change in progress, which basically is either the phasing out of a word or the introduction of a new word. We also have something called age-graded change, and that basically says that if you're in a certain age demographic, you're going to use this word. If you're in any other age demographic, you're not. So fad language or focused on a certain generation, topics that are popular in that generation, those things are more likely something that will phase out with that generation versus something that will stay in the community, um, in the linguistic community for the rest of the time. When we got the first version of it, we took it to the Bermuda Bookstore, and Mr. Jim Zool thought it was a great idea and loved it, but he provided us with a half a dozen or more of our previous generation, and those are some of my, my, my favorite ones. But it was a Vata Day for Potsy. It's something I'd never heard before, and probably hasn't been used in 50 years. Vat a day for Potsy. Apparently, back in the day before there were cars, taxis were horse and carriage drivers. If it was a very rainy day, there was no fares for the carriage drivers. And a gentleman named Potsy had a betting parlor around Marsh Folly. So if it was a rainy day, Potsy would have a very good day because all the taxi drivers would be there betting in his shop. So that was apparently an expression back in the day for a very rainy day it was a good day for Potsy. Things like that that I find most interesting because they're not in use today. And even in the 20 years since we started doing this, a lot of the words aren't used anymore among, amongst the younger generations. Pumpkin on the wine. It means you have a bun in the oven. Or it did. I don't know if it does anymore, but it did at one point. You could have a sinker, which is beef pie. Probably called a sinker because of a fishing line because they're heavy. But they're good, especially with mayonnaise. The stock market. Crown and anchor tables at cup match. Tank rain, good enough rain to, to fill your tank. Very Bermudian. And Warwick lizards, you know Warwick lizards, the great big lizards. Why they're bigger in Warwick than anywhere else, I'm not exactly sure, but. We didn't do this as a scholarly work. We weren't trying to record the, the, the language of the culture. We were just out to have fun. There have been so many outside influences that have, been, have had an impact on us. That's why we need to know what our vernacular is, even if you've gone on to something new. In the early years, you had an English regiment here. A lot of Bermudians worked at the dockyard. You had the American bases that were established in the 40s during World War I. A lot of our young people go off to school in other places. 
Also, we have tourism and people who work in the service industries. It's almost like living eight hours a day in a foreign culture. And because they're around the tourists, they would take on some form of an American accent because we mimic. So they were taking on their ways, their expressions, their use of the language, and dropping their own. But I think the early vernacular, or the, what I'm referring to now, is part of your roots. And that's why we need to know, because we need to know our whole history. We need to know all of the aspects of our culture, so that when we are exposed to these other things, we will also know our own. And if we have a respect for our own, we won't drop it to take on the foreign aspects, or we won't let them displace our own. They can enrich, but we don't want them to, to displace what we have. You guys heard about Tonky? No. Tonky came over his bike, wrong PAC. No. no. Yeah, he's in the hospital. No, he got, he's in a coma. Who? Yeah. He's in a coma? Yeah. What's a coma? <laughs> a coma is like a really long, deep, serious mice. <laughs> Young people today, I don't think, are they're certainly not using the same idiom and vocabulary that we used when I was growing up. I think it should be recorded because it's going away. If Jim Zool hadn't have told us those few words, I would never have known them, and they may have passed into history without anybody knowing they existed. I think that you have to realize that it's changing, it's not disappearing. Losing a dialect takes a long time. You can't just say, you know, in the next 10 years, we're not going to have a dialect. Um, it'll take hundreds of years to get rid of it because the words that you use change faster than the sounds that you make. You have to have face-to-face -face contact in order to change the way that you sound. So media actually doesn't have that much of an impact on the way that you speak, as many people think. Media actually plays more of a role in our fad language, so what's trendy, like the Charlie Sheen thing, winning or whatever it was. That's media at work, not language or dialect or anything like that. And I think that it's important to get that out there, that media really doesn't have that much of an impact. So I think that we're not at risk of losing our dialect, but I think that we should definitely be more educated about it, we should celebrate it more, we should talk about it more around the table. And I think that's one of the things that I was happy about by sharing my studies with the community is that it got people talking. Whether they agreed that the dialect was a good thing or not, it got you talking and bringing back that sense of community. So I think it's a good thing that we preserve our dialect and, and keep it going. I don't write in the vernacular. But in a book that's done by the Department of Cultural Affairs, Bermuda Anthology of Poetry, in that book is a poem by Arthur De Silva. And I have to read you a little something from this. And he talks about a friend of his whose name is Bungie. And he says, that lady by, you know, he's his cousin. Cousin, of course. But he talks about, at cup match time, you never knew which team he liked. And that's a fact. Cause blue and blue was tied up front and blue and red was on the back. He didn't care which side beat long as it were no draw. He didn't have no favorite, see? Yeah, Bungie liked them all. Now when you see that in writing, you know exactly what the word is supposed to be. And you say, oh, that's the way it should be written. You know, he's, he's got it. Our vernacular, it's very difficult to write. The one person who really had it down to a fine art and was just dead on was Jeremy Frith. But it is hard to do. And yes, I would love for somebody to, to make a real effort at um, capturing it in written form because it's suffering, I think. Not just the vernacular, so many aspects of our culture, so many of our traditions have gone. Well, you can't help it, culture is forever changing. It's not static, it's dynamic. 
So it's a responsibility for somebody to get that stuff, to record it, in both in writing and through the electronic media, I think. I want to give you guys some Bermudian. This one's called Bermudian Poet. It goes like this. Born on the tip of volcanic lips, the lava we spit, most cannot take. So I sometimes serve mine. I'm warm for the foreigners that can't relate. See, our lava lakes move mountains like tectonic plates. So when it cools, it hardens in your memory banks until your memory stanks from the stench of our flow. Like Spittle's poem and a hurricane coming too close. So check your shock oil, yo, cause we're everywhere in between. The cannons of St. Catherine to the west gates of image dreams. No walls can stop our steam. Railway trails is what we leave. Inspiration is what we see to those that are lost at sea. A Bermudian poet, I am he. A lighthouse to those that need to avoid reefs that we have seen. Harbor Radio just might agree that we'll be making waves all up and on your front street. And no, we cannot be like a man from another land. Cause why would I change me, Bermudian, forever, man? No matter where on the time of day, rhymes taste like swizzle. Dark and stormy, black old day, 150A. Come check the proof. Or oh, come around, chew stick, we blow off your roof. Woo! Fabian truth to the highest power. Respect, freedom, love, truth. 22 miles, 24 hours. Done. Yeah. I can't really say there's one thing that influenced me completely, cause, except Bermuda. Because that, that's just where I am and how I move. That's how I started out as a recording artist, and took, listening to how words sound and how they tie together. So that's what I fell in love with, the way the words taste and the way the, the vibe that people get from it and what you could take away from it and hopefully shift your perspective on certain things. We have poems, screenplays, shows that are put on in our Bermudian dialect where you can go and experience that, celebrate your dialect in a different format. And we need to expose ourselves to different ways of writing, different ways of speaking, and I think that it's important to learn the difference between speaking in your dialect and speaking in a more standard form, and I think it'll benefit the young people greatly. I became interested in writing when I was a little girl because I read The Bobsy Twins. And I was not happy about the portrayal of the maid and the butler. And I mentioned it to my mother. And my mother said, that's the way that author wrote it. Write your own stories. I took her seriously and began writing my own stories. All of my playmates at the Central School used to line up for the stories because I think it was something unique for them and of course they became characters in the book. And one of my poems became The Song of Sandro and I thought that was a great deal. And that was the beginning of my interest in writing. I like a good story, stories that take my mind off of what's around me, that absorbs me. And then that's what I like when I tell a story. You have to be passionate about your story and get your audience to feel that message without preaching. I think it brings a community together. That's the beauty of storytelling. So I enjoyed storytelling and I've been doing it ever since. I think the poetry movement in Bermuda is strong. When I was coming up, there was not a lot of people my age, generation, that was into poetry. But these kids today, they've, they've come a long way. And they're younger than when I started doing it seriously, and they're amazing. I've been helping around Chew Stick, and we, we teach a group called Chew Slam, which is a group of young poets. And the teaching thing's been tricky, because I'm not sure exactly what it is that I know. And for me to translate that and show somebody was my biggest hurdle because I'm just never good at English in English class. And I don't consider myself a master of technical poetry. I just wrote stuff organically. You got your slam poets, then you got your technical writers, then you got guys like me who just do whatever. <laughs> so everything that I've done has just been involved organically over the years, performing in different audiences. I've picked up different things, writing different ways, and it's just been how I've moved. And I was working with Chris Aswood, and he's a young poet. And we're so different. 
Like he has got a master's in poetry, right? So he was showing me different rhyme schemes, different meters, and he was pointing out stuff in my rhyme that I, I don't know the name for it. It just, it just felt right when I wrote it. And when I had conversations with Chris and with the kids, it was amazing for me because I start to see, you know, the stuff that I was doing that, you know, they'll teach you in school, which never really stuck with me. But apparently it did stick with me subconsciously because it's coming out in my work. So as long as more of us come out, I think moving forward, more kids would start to, to get into it and, and take it to levels far beyond. I just set the bar. I got a good baby on me <laughs> as far as I see it. And I think that would be amazing. Because a large part of my thanks for getting these papers done is to the Bermudian community. Because for my study, I sent an email out and I got over a thousand responses just from people sending the email out to different people. So a large part of my thanks goes to the Bermudian community. And I think that's great because it shows that we are still interested in our dialect. So that's how I started gathering the data. And then from there, just simply analyzing it which took a long time. <laughs> yeah. On the island is a traffic group. No matter what you drive, you gotta keep it cool. But the diddly bops like to break away, making speed records on the highway. Diddly bops in the goose that count over. Zig seconds to the motor car. Come round the corner for on the road. Up on the sidewalk, I had to go. of my name, Johnny Brown, driving horse and carriage around town, the diddly bops drive him out of his mind, they wouldn't stop to this stop sign. The inventor of these handlebars. Must come from the planet Mars. The seats are low, the handles so high, like a man reaching to the sky. The daily bumps and the goose neck handle back, baby. Six seconds to the motor car. Come round the corner for on the road. I find the sidewalk ahead to go. I stood out the other day, making 20 miles on the highway. Something like a rocket shot past me. It was a daily bump on us. Daily bumps in the goose neck, candle bump. Six seconds to the motor car. Come round the corner of one road. Up on the sidewalk, I had to go. Matching the gas tank.